All right, if everybody will take their seat, we'll get going. Okay, I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners for Saturday, November 5th, 2022. Um, I'm gonna ask Commissioner Wise to lead us in the pledge. Thank you. The department will take the roll. Chair Cavilia? Here. Vice Chair Rogers? Here. Commissioner East? Here. Commissioner Keel? Here. Commissioner McNinch? Here. Commissioner Wise? Here. Commissioner Walther? Here. Commissioner Perini? Commissioner Barnes? All right, and Commissioner Perini is in Canada, and Commissioner Barnes had a, another engagement today, so. Would the county, county advisory board members in attendance please announce themselves? <laughs> and then I guess, are there any cabs on Zoom? No. Okay. Uh, approval of agenda. Chairman Cavilia for possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration, or take items out, out of order. And just as a quick reminder, the tour of the Lennar Pond is going to be today. Uh, we didn't we ran out of time yesterday. So any comments or questions on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Any cab comment on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Any public comment on the agenda in Reno? Okay, seeing none, any public comment on Zoom? Okay, bring it back to the commission. Vice Chair Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I would uh, like to go ahead and uh, make a motion of approval of the minutes um, with the one noted um, uh, comment this morning on the tour for Lennar. And I don't know if it, it needs noting uh, as well. We noted it yesterday, but on agenda item 16, that um, uh, adjustment of the date for the next commission meeting being January 27 and January 28. And I believe you mean the approval of the agenda, right? You said minutes. We just want to double check. I think I did that <laughs> last time too. <laughs> Good heavens. I apologize. So yes, how about the approval of today's agenda? With the uh, with the noted change of, on uh, the tour for Lennar, and then again that change on agenda item number 16, the uh, scheduled next scheduled commission meeting being January 27 and January 28. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, so I've got a uh, a motion by Vice Chair Rogers, second by Commissioner East. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Perini and um, Barnes absent. Item number 12, member items, announcements, <coughs> and correspondence, uh, informational. Commission members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission. Since the last regular meeting, it may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wosley may also be discussed. And I didn't really have anything other than uh, yesterday we asked a question about the fatality in Elko County uh, earlier in the week, and the Elko Daily actually did a report on it, and it sounds like it was an accident uh, loading, the, loading a gun in a vehicle, an accidental discharge. Yeah, yeah, so it's a super sad deal. Um, I don't have anything else. I don't know if anyone else does or... Tony? Yeah, go ahead. Um, actually, I did this morning receive correspondence from Karen Boger, and she just left. But she shared with us the Wild Horse uh, white paper that I believe Alan Janay wrote. And so it would be great if the commission could get a copy of it. 
I don't think the commission was copied on this. I, I was, but I don't think the other commissioners were, so that'd be great. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? No? All right. With that, I'll close agenda item number 12. We'll go to agenda item number 13. County advisory boards to manage wildlife member items, informational. CAB members may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Any CAB items? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna to go to agenda item 14. Commission regulation for possible action adoption, public comment allowed. 14A, commission regulation 2302, taking of raptors for falconry for 2023-2024. Wildlife Diversity Administrator Jennifer Newmark for possible action. The commission will consider and may take action to approve the 2023-2024 season. Dates, species, quotas, limits, closed areas, application procedures and deadlines, and take of raptors for falconry. Good morning. For the record, I'm Jen Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. This is um, a two-year commission regulation 2302 for uh, falconry. Um, just as an overview for um, just what the numbers of raptors and the kinds of raptors that we have in Nevada, there's 18 regularly occurring diurnal raptors. Those are raptors that are active during daylight hours. We have 15 breeding species and three additional migrants. And we have 11 species of nocturnal raptors, owls, um, that breed in Nevada. We are proposing that we would allow eight diurnal and one nocturnal um, species to be used in falconry. And I should note too that um, with the exception of one species that we'll talk about in a minute, um, these regulations are the same as they have been in the past. We're only proposing one change. So a snapshot of what falconry looks like um, in Nevada over the last 12 years, we've had a total of 70 birds removed from the wild for falconry. Um, looking at 2021, which is that top line there, um, you can see that there are there were 31 applicants and 30 uh, falconers represented in that group. And the reason why those two numbers don't match is because we allow a falconer to submit two applications um, in the regulations. So one falconer in 2021 had um, put in two applications. Nine of those um, falconers were successful in taking nine raptors. Um, two or three red tail hawks, excuse me, two Cooper's hawks, a prairie falcon, um, an Ias goshawk, a nestling, um, <clears throat> one kestrel, and one merlin. So you can just see over the course of time that um, the numbers that have been in each species, the most commonly taken one for. Um, I just realized that I said 70 total, but that's not right. I don't know how to do math early on a Saturday morning. <laughs> 70 plus all of those, so excuse my, uh, my error there. Um, but the most common species that's removed is red tail hawk. So for our 23-24 uh, regulations, again, these are exact the same as last time around, where we are limiting um, one raptor per minute per permit of not more than any species. The exception is that under the authority of their second capture permit, if a falconer takes a raptor and that bird is um, released um, and doesn't come back, if it's lost, or if it um, dies in captivity, they have the opportunity to um, go out and get a second bird. There's a limit of two permits issued to any one person in a calendar year and raptors can be taken any time of the day or night during the open season. The species that are open to falconry, we have Cooper's hawks, sharp-shinned hawk, prairie falcon, merlin, kestrels, red tail hawk, ferruginous hawk, and great horned owl. We also allow a northern goshawk. These are all open statewide with the exception of northern goshawk, which are closed um, in Elko County north of I-80. The asterisks that you see on those species, prairie falcon, kestrel, and ferruginous hawk, those are species that we've identified in our state wildlife action plan as species of greatest conservation need. 
Um, the seasons that we're proposing, the IS season would run from March 1st through August 31st of each year, and the passage season would go from January 1st to December 31st. Um, we continue to recommend that one IS be left in each nest from which a raptor is captured, so that means that you um, can remove just one nestling. Uh, no IS may be removed prior to 10 days of age, and no nesting area or IRE may be entered when the young are 28 days or older, and that's to prevent um, uh, fledgling, fledging out of the nest too early, which can be very detrimental to them. For quotas, sharp-shinned um, hawks, cooper's hawks, merlins, red-tailed hawks, and great horned owls um, we allow, we're recommending that we allow unlimited resident applications and a limit of three non-resident applications, and we'll set, um, recommending a quota that of 50 individuals. This is the same as in prior years. Um, in prior years, we had American kestrels in this group, but because we added them as a species of greatest conservation need in our state wildlife action plan, um, we have bumped them down to the next level, um, which is similar and consistent with the rest of the species that are species of greatest conservation need. So that's prairie falcon, uh, passage, northern goshawk, um, and American kestrel, and then we're recommending unlimited resident applications, three non-resident applications, and a quota of 15 individuals. <clears throat> For IS Northern Goshawk, those nestlings, we're recommending a resident limit of 10 applications and non-resident limit of three applications and a quota of 10 individuals. And ferruginous hawks, uh, we're recommending a resident limit of five applications, a non-resident limit of one application, and a quota of five individuals. And I just want to bring this slide back up so that you can see sort of the context of those um, quotas. Uh, we've never reached a quota where we've had to close the season, um, and especially for kestrels that were, they went from a 50 quota down to the 15. You can see here in this slide that um, the max number of two has been taken in any one year. So um, we don't expect that change to impact um, the, you know, our uh, falconers very much. And with that, I will be happy to attempt to answer any questions. Any questions? Commissioner um, East. Um, I, just, I just don't know enough about this. So I apologize because this might be a silly question. But is it, I mean, you're removing a, an IS from a, a nest. Is that considered healthy? <laughs> I guess I, I just I just don't know enough. You know, usually you leave a, a an infant with its parent or mother for a lot longer. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner East. It's actually a really good question, and um, so in raptors, especially, they often have multiple nestlings, and typically, one of those nestlings isn't going to make it. Oftentimes, um, they have asynchronous growth just because, like the way that they lay eggs, one will be a day or two older than the other, and so they'll actually like kick out the nestling. So the idea is that this would be this isn't additive mortality to them; it's compensatory. So we're, okay. we'll remove a, a nestling and then there's still, that's why we require that there still be a nestling left in the nest for um, that reproduction. Okay, thanks. And I'm just going to make a quick pitch. Um, I meant to do it during member announcements, but that um, conversation we had yesterday with the gentleman from the falconry organization, I would love to see them come back for a conservation spotlight. It's just, I think we just don't spend enough time on some of these species that um, only get attention periodically. So, all right, that was it for me, thanks. Any additional, Vice Chair Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, obviously, same as, as Commissioner East, you know, not, you know, too terribly familiar, but I guess I'm just curious, obviously we hear, you know, a ton uh, on, on big game species throughout Nevada and what effect you know, drought and, and habitat and all these other things have affected populations and, and, and these various species. J just curious, what effects have 
you know, the drought conditions and habitat and all that, what effect that has had on the birds? Thank you for the, que the question. Um, I think that it has had some significant effects on certain species. Um, for example, golden eagles in general um, were, you know, a little worried because their prey base is um, tanking. They're, they are um, highly dependent on, um, uh, oh my gosh, I really am like having a hard time this morning, uh, on uh, um, help. Rabbits, phone a friend. <laughs> uh, Lagomorphs. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why my brain is blanking. But on um, uh, jackrabbits, oh my gosh, that was the word I was looking for. Um, so they're highly dependent on jackrabbits, and those populations have been very low. Um, so, and large largely because of drought and disease. Um, and other species, goshawks, um, they're highly dependent, especially in northeastern Nevada on um, riparian and aspen areas. And those are areas that are um, clearly wet areas, and so drought has a big impact on them. So those are some of the subtleties that we see in the regulations where we have I-80 closed for, um, for goshawks to allow that population to not have any additional stress. Um, we're not, I wouldn't say that I'm concerned though that falconry is um, impacting in any negative way because the, the take is so low and also I, you know, again, it's more compensatory rather than additive mortality. Commissioner McNitch. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But along those same lines, um, I guess it's just kind of a side note. You know, things like climate change are having notably impacts on certain species. And when we're talking raptors, like rough-legged hawks in particular, they're not migrating. They're not wintering as far south as they used to. And there's there's direct correlations to that and and climate change now. So um, so drought. You know, um, it's all those related type of issues. So there are significant. Um, uh, rough legs aren't part of our conversation today, but um, so whether it's drought or climate change, you know, they're all susceptible to it. And there's definitely science indicating, um, and you see it in our bird counts every every winter, um, that those species are tending to migrate much farther, uh, much less south than they used to. They're staying further north. Any additional questions? Seeing none, I'll take it out to the cabs. Any, oh, Tony, go ahead. I, I was just going to uh, reiterate one of the points that Jen made with raptors in, in particular. Um, some species have as much as like 80% mortality or loss in, in those offspring. And so it's a biologically, it's, it's one of those concepts where we talk about less is more. And we actually are securing, you know, some of these populations. Um, by inc not only increasing the survivorship of the the remaining IS, um, but by having some some of that genetic material, you know, e extant in in some of those uh, with some of those falconers, I I, uh, I know that um, you know, some of our biases when we think about populations and we think about mortality and with human populations, you know, we we don't have the same kind of of seasonal uh, challenges. We don't have the same mortality events, whether it's winter, um, overwinter survival. And it's just another example of where wildlife, sometimes less is more. And by, by sometimes removing animals, we can actually increase the health and the survivorship of the remaining animals. Thank you. Okay, Cab, let's go to Cab comments, Steve Robinson. Good morning, Chair and uh, Commission. As Steve Robinson Washoe. At our meeting this week, we had a falconer, uh, Mr. Rick Lund. I don't know if he spoke yesterday, but um, he was hoping to change the northern, the closure of um, Elko County north of I 80 for the northern goshawk. And so our proposal was under brief explanation of proposed regulations, the second uh, paragraph, to say northern goshawk statewide except Elko County north of I 80, which IS northern goshawk is closed. Um, he was hoping that the passage northern goshawk could be taken, as um, the falconers apparently say that that's a migratory route and it would have no negative uh, consequences. And then the change also in the area, um, the areas, the take of IS northern goshawk is closed in Elko County north of I-80. Thank you. 
no other changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jacob Thompson for the record from the Clark County Cab. Uh, one of our cab members suggested that Merlin hawks are rare in this state and primarily rent, w only winter here, um, and therefore he would recommend reducing the quota to 15 from 50, uh, given the data that we just saw about take. I'm not sure that that is all that important now, but I felt like it was worth at least relaying the cab's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional cab comment? Okay, seeing none, any public comment? Excuse me, uh, Karen Taylor, Washoe County resident. I wasn't able to be here yesterday for the Falconer's presentation, and I didn't see it on YouTube yet. Um, but I appreciate you looking at uh, your comments about whether or not there's research to support the removal of birds increasing populations, and also to find out is there research to support that disturbing the nest reduces populations. As someone who's not a biologist, and just as general reading, I've, I read stuff like that, that if, we, if someone goes near a nest, that that can actually disturb the nest and maybe the adult leaves. Um, and also, I know there's training for falconers, but what are the penalties uh, for not caring properly for birds and are there inspections of falconers you know, when they're keeping these birds? How do they keep them? Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, any public comment on Zoom? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. And I guess, Jen, do you mind answering the, the question like the Northern Goshawk uh, in Elko Cam County? For the record, Jen Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. I think, um, in my opinion, the department is more comfortable keeping that area enclosed. It's um, the populations there are not in the same shape as in other areas. And uh, um, so that would be our recommendation. I think what I would like to um, suggest is that we do, over the next couple of years, we could take a look at that and see if there is some merit for passage. Um, I haven't seen any evidence at this time that that wouldn't impact so that so my continued recommendation would be leave it closed okay thank you uh what about and then the question about the merlin as well uh again for the record jen newmark and um and then as you can see and actually let me go back to it um over the last 12 years we've only had four merlins removed and um and i do agree that they are not um, as common in nevada as say like a red tail hawk they don't breed here um, but i think that level of take is is low enough that it shouldn't impact their um, populations at all Any additional commission questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I, I that makes sense to me. I mean, we see them. You know, I understand the uh, the cab's comment. Um, you know, you do typically see uh, see them more. Um, if, you know, through the fall and early spring. You know, that time frame. But you know, less so during the summer for sure. But the take is so um, so small. It kind of reflects the you know, a proportionate number that are coming through probably there's, it's not a, um, we're just not seeing people targeting them is my read on it, so, yeah. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion to approve, um, if you're if you're ready, uh, Commission Regulation 2302, taking of Raptors for Falconry for 2023 through 2024 as proposed by the department. Okay, so we've got a motion by Commissioner McNich, seconded by Vice Chair Rogers, to, con to approve Commission General Re Regulation 23-02, the taking of Raptors for Falconry for 2023-2024, as presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Motion carries unanimously with uh, Commissioner Perini and Barnes absent. So we go to agenda item number 14B, Commission General Regulation 
2023-03 non-commercial collection of reptiles and amphibians for 2023 and 2024. Wildlife Diversity Administrator Jennifer Newmark for possible action. The Commission will consider and may take action to approve 2023-2024 season and limits for non-commercial hobby collecting of live unprotected reptiles and amphibians. Jennifer Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator for the record. So this regulation is for non-commercial collection of reptiles and amphibians. The department is not re is recommending no changes from the previous two years. So um, all of that I'm presenting is going to be the same um, proposal as we have brought forward in the past. Um, again, just to kind of give you an overview, there's 56 native species of reptiles that occur in Nevada, 28 species of snake, 26 species of lizards, and two species of turtle. Um, desert tortoises are technically turtles, um, which I always have to remind myself. Uh, 39 are allowed for non-commercial collection and seven of the um, seven species total are state protected within our NAC. For the upcoming two year cycle, we are continuing to recommend a bag limit of two of each of these species per year, a possession limit of two of each of these species and no more than 24 in total. And so these lizards that are listed here are what's recommended for that um, level. And similarly, here are the snakes that are also recommended for a bag limit of two each, possession two each, and not more than 24 total. For um, these species of lizards, we are recommending a bag limit of five each um, and a possession limit of five each. These species are a little bit more common and, um, and are typically the ones that, um, you know, small kids like to try to get after and collect. And then uh, finally, for our amphibians and non-native, um, our native amphibians, we're recommending four of each um, and a total of four. And then um, our non-native amphibians and reptiles are unlimited. And with that, I'll take any questions. And I just want to look up one quick thing because I feel like I might have just smoke it, misspoken on, yes, four of each. I just want to make sure that the regulation said that. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Newmark? Seeing none, um, I'll take it out for cab comment. Any cab comment? Very quickly, Jacob Thompson, Clark Cab, for the record. Uh, one of our cab members suggested that in southern Nevada, common chuckwalla numbers have steeply declined, and therefore we would recommend removing them from the list of lizard species uh, that can be collected perhaps just in that region. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional cab comment? Okay, seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, any public comment on Zoom? Okay, bring it back to the commission. And I guess, uh, Jen, real quick, is there a concern with the, the Chuck Walla? Thank you for the question, Jen Newmark, uh, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. Uh, I did note that comment from the Clark County CAB, and I have actually spoken and asked our herpetologist, Jason Jones, to start looking at that. Um, we don't have any evidence per se that they are, but I suspect that they are. So we would like to look at that. We felt for this particular uh, regulation that we didn't have enough data to bring to you to suggest that change, um, but I would like to investigate it over the next couple of years and have directed um, our herpetologist to start designing some kind of work around that. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Go ahead, Commissioner East. I have a silly question. What's the lizard I see at my house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to guess it's a fence lizard. A fence lizard? Yeah. Is that on here? 
<laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm just curious. I, they're everywhere. Yeah, they are. Then they're the ones that, like the blue bellies. Yeah. Yeah. And they they're the ones questions. that are really, yeah, accessible to kids and, you know, go out in your backyard and collect them. Or if you're my dog, chase them. Yes. Okay. I was just curious. Thanks yep. for allowing me that. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Keel. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and move to approve Commission Regulation 2303, Non-Commercial Collection of Reptiles and Amphibians for 2023 and 2024 as presented by the Department. I'll second. Okay, so we got a motion by Commissioner Keel, second by Commissioner East to approve Commission Regulation 2303 non-commercial collection of reptiles and amphibians for 2023-2024 as pre presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry, motion carries unanimously with uh, Commissioner Perini and Barnes absent. So now we'll go to agenda item number 14C, Commission Regulation 22-12, Amendment Number 1, Upland and Fur Bear Seasons, Management Analysis Megan Manfredi for possible action, the commission will consider and may take action to approve the proposed changes amending the turkey, the spring turkey application period and draw dates for the 2023 season. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, members of the commission, management analyst Megan Manfredi for the record. The entire Upland uh, Commission regulation has been noticed, but I'd like to focus on page seven for the turkey applications. Um, so every year the department meets to set the schedule for the application periods and draw dates. When setting the schedule for 23 application season, we noticed an overlap already and approved the, in the already approved application draw dates for spring turkey and when the department was wanting to open the non-resident guided hunt application period. The proposed change will allow for the department to schedule the spring turkey application period and draw dates earlier than what was originally approved um, to limit that overlap. You will also see a change that references a different commission regulation for the 2024 draw dates for Turkey. The department plans to combine all offered application periods and draw dates into one commission regulation, and that regulation will be brought to the commission every January for approval. It was originally titled the big game application uh, deadlines, but that title will most likely change due to some addition of upland game and waterfowl. But with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Seeing none, I will take it out for cab comment. Any cab comment? Back again, uh, Jacob Thompson, Clark Cab for the record. Uh, two uh, recommendations or suggestions from our cab. Uh, the first was based uh, on public comment at the cab from a person who commonly hunts in the Moapa Valley for wild turkey. Uh, and that person suggested that the 2024 hunts in the Moapa Valley all be moved back one week from the current suggested dates that would set them at March 16th through the 23rd, March 23rd through the 29th, and March 30th through April 5th. This way, the season would begin on the third Saturday in March, as it has for many years. And the uh, member of the public also suggested that if it's one week later, it's starting to get very hot uh, in April. Um, the second suggestion uh, from our cab was due to declining sage grouse numbers, we believe that the total season limit should be set at two birds. Thank you. Any additional cab comment? Okay, seeing none, any public comment in Reno? Seeing none, any public comment on Zoom? Nope, okay, we'll bring it back to the commission for any questions or comments. Commissioner East. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can we get an opinion about that uh, season change for Moapa Valley on the, that was the junior hunt. Is that on the regular hunt too, sorry? I wrote it on the junior side. Uh, well, turkey, here it is. So is that a, we've got the, it starts, it looks like in Moapa Valley, it starts on the 18th. 
did were they concerned about the about the junior hunt or the I guess I'm asking the Clark cab yeah, I'm, I'm right now. okay okay because it appears unless I'm looking at the wrong thing but I don't think I am it appears that it starts actually for adults on the 18th of March which would be within the range do you have a comment oh okay you can go to Commissioner Keel. Yeah, maybe Kiel. just a question. Are we able to even change the quotas or season dates? Not in this one. Yeah, I didn't think so. Oh, uh, we're not. Okay. Yeah, you're right. We can't. We can only adjust, approve the change. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Well, then that doesn't. Okay. Yeah, and just for clarification, we were, were only agendized to change the spring turkey application periods. We weren't. It wasn't Not agendized to go into the dates, correct? Sorry. Okay. Well, then I'm comfortable with it if you'd like to. Are there questions? No? I'd be happy to make a motion then. Sure. Okay, so I move to approve Commission Regulation 22-12, Amendment Number 1, Upland and Fur Bearer Seasons, um, as presented. Okay, so I have a motion by Commissioner East, second by Vice Chair Rogers to, com to approve commission, commission Regulation 22-12, Amendment Number 1, Upland and Fur Bearer Seasons, as presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Okay, motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Perini and Barnes absent. Agenda item number 15, Commission General Regulation for Possible Action Adoption, Public Comment Allowed. 15A, Commission General Regulation 508, Antler Points and Spike Elk Defined, Wildlife Staff Specialist Cody McKee. The Commission will adopt, consider adopting NAC 502 that would clarify definitions pertaining to Antler Point and Spike Elk for certain big game mammals and reduce the potential occurrence of inad inadvertent infractions. Cody. Uh, Chairman Caviglia. Cody McKee, for the record, um, I'm happy to be back today talking again about antler points um, and spike elk definitions. I'll go through this presentation here really quickly, but um, first I just wanted to talk about why we're here. And uh, chapter uh, 502 of NA NAC uh, discusses antler point definitions and um, the department's asking the commission to consider uh, our proposed revision to antler point, or a, a proposed clarification, um, essentially um, ensuring that uh, all antler points on, an, on a bull elk um, are considered uh, for uh, classification. And then for spike elk definition, uh, we're, we're trying to reduce confusion for hunters in the field uh, by taking out a reference to ear length. And um, I, this, this presentation, um, I think will go a long ways towards explaining uh, why that why we think that's confusing and kind of what our data is showing us in uh, spike elk harvest from the last three years. So um, the intent of our existing language for spike elk and NAC uh, was to provide flexibility to our hunters when they encounter spike elk in the field that have antler anomalies. And um, this picture right here is is kind of the 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 reference photo for what we're talking about because um, the current definition indicates that uh, a spike elk can have no more than two points above the ear. And what you'll see here at the very base of this antler on this young male bull is these anomalies of projections that kind of go crosswise and, and all over the place. So there was, uh, there was good intent in this definition when it was proposed kind of taking a step back, our first definition for spike elk in 2014 was actually a true spike. Um, so a bull that had just essentially two unicorn points on either side. Um, but based on public comment that we received in 2016, it was revised to the, the current definition that we see today. Um, however, I think that our harvest data indicates that hunters are probably infrequently encountering bulls like this in the field. Um, and then also just going back to the intention of the department's desire to revise this definition, we're just trying to minimize confusion and make it easier for hunters in the field. 
I've been on spike elk hunts where you're looking over these very young bulls trying to decide if it's above the year, below the year. Um, and I think that could potentially lead to inadvertent infractions. So at the last commission meeting, um, I, I think uh, Commissioner Walther asked about the breakdown in spike harvest by antler points. Um, I, I do know this was, this was requested. So if we go back and look at the last three years of harvest, this bull on the left is a true spike. So a one point antler, um, no more than one point on either antler. 88% of our spike harvest during those three years was comprised of bull elk that had this one point or less um, antler. So you'll see a very large proportion of the harvest that occurred over this time was, was a single point. Uh, two points or less was comprised of 97% of the harvest. So you'll see just between these two classifications of bulls, uh, we got the majority of our harvest. Now I'm gonna kind of jump over to where we start to, I think th these are the bulls that start to create confusion for our hunters in the field. Three point or less was 98%. So you'll see from a two point to a three point, we only increased harvest by 1%. And then these four points, so the photo on the right, that comprised 99% of the harvest. And I will say that I think we had six bulls harvested in this time that had three or more antler points out of 286 bulls killed during the spike, spike only hunts. And this is a picture that I received from a hunter last fall. These are the ones that are creating confusion amongst our hunters. Um, so again, with this, definition of no more than two antler points above the year. I'll bring the commission's attention to uh, this, just this side view here. We'll see that there's four antler projections coming from uh, this right antler. The first one is the very top of the spike. The second one down appears to branch at the very top of the ear. And then there's two more branches below the ear when the hunter asked me if this was a legal bull under our definition, I said no. Um, and the reason is, I don't know, I can't interpret where that branch, that second branch comes from. Is it branching from the ear? Is it branching above the ear, below the ear? In conversations with other personnel within the agency, they said that this was a harvestable bull. That right there um, really highlights and underscores the, the need to kind of clarify what this is. If our personnel can't explain what a spike bull is. How can we expect our hunters to know what a spike bull is in the field? Um, so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions about this presentation, or, as well as our, our um, request to just add some clarification to antler point definition. Okay, any questions for Cody? Vice Chair Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, it, it, and, and I appreciate the the um, photos there, Cody. I, th I think that definitely sh sheds some light on the subject, not only this one, but the previous ones. But to me, it just kind of seems like where the confusion is, is not necessarily on the points, a single spike, two point, three point. It's, in my opinion, it's the language of above the ear. So are, are we better off leaving it at because what we're proposing is taking out the two, increasing it to three, and removing the ear language. Are we any better off leaving the language at two and just removing the piece of above the ear? Two points either side. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Rogers, Cody McKee for the record. That's a great question, and I guess I was prepared to answer it uh, and, and the reason so is, the reason being, um, if I have my biologist hat on um, and we're talking about two point or three point, um, we're getting the desired harvest of young bulls. Um, if, we take, if we take a look at the harvest data, um, we saw that 97% of our spike harvest was two points or less anyways. The reason the department proposed three was, you know, we might do a better job of addressing some of those anomalies if, if a hunter in the field doesn't see that it has a funny point coming out at the very base of the antler. But I think from a, uh, an agency standpoint, from a, a 3R standpoint, 
uh, when we restrict those antler points, we're probably gonna have slightly lower success on these hunts, but that actually means we'll be able to issue a few more tags and still hit that desired harvest level. Now, unfortunately, our hunters that are probably interested in this regulation aren't gonna be here today, and they'll probably consider going to two points more restrictive, but really the conversation I think that we should be having is, is around, well, how, what's acceptable? Um, are we okay making it a little bit more restrictive, understanding that we're getting almost all the harvest that we already did with two point, um, but we're also maybe giving us a little bit more flexibility to, to add a few more tags next year. Any additional questions or comments? I mean, I, I, I brought up the two points last time too. I kind of like that white pine cab brought up the two points as well. The two points also kind of mirrors a couple other states also. Um, and I do, I do absolutely like getting rid of the top of the ear criteria. And I mean, even if you leave it at the two points based on the data, it's 97% of the harvest. So I don't know if it's, you know, that big of a deal really, but I guess we could see what everyone else thinks. The additional commission comment. Commissioner Keel. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll go ahead and chime in. I, I totally agree. Getting rid of the year is at the base of the year, at the top of the year. That's a tough one, and that photo definitely helps explain that. And honestly, I'm probably fine with the three as well. Where I think I get hung up on this is the spike versus the management. And, you know, there's enough benefits with this, you know, where people aren't going to get sideways with one anomaly that, you know, you know, I'm not willing to die on the sword for management hunt versus spike. It just seems clunky to me, um, a spike when we're trying to accomplish what in my mind should be called, you know, a management hunt. But like I say, either way, um, I support the three antler and certainly getting rid of above the top of the air. Additional commission questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna take it out for cab comment. Any cab comment? For the record, Jacob Thompson from the Clark Cab. Uh, the Clark Cab supports this uh, regulation change, but strongly recommends the Nevada Hunt Book have graphic graphics and or pictures that uh, assist hunters in understanding the three point on either side definition. Uh, like other surrounding states have in their hunt books as well. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Krim, Persian Cab. Like I had said the last time when I was at this meeting, I, I talked to a few people since the last meeting about this, sportsmen and sportswomen around the state, not necessarily where I live, but elsewhere. And they think that it's really confusing to call it a spike hunt, but it can still have branched antlers. The overall concern is that that is very misleading to the general public. It should be called a management hunt to obtain the, or to get the goal that's intended here. Management hunt is a better name for it than a spike. Spike has a whole different definition, and I know they're trying to change it, but it's still misleading to the general public. Steve Robinson, Washoe. And we had similar uh, comments. We've had a lot of discussion at our cab meetings on this. And we would like to leave, you know, we, we don't agree with calling a raghorn a spike. And that's, that's starting to be confusing. So instead of continually changing the definition of a spike to reduce the confusion, we'd like to change the name of the hunt when it comes time to do this to a management hunt three points or less. Um, we'd like to just call a spike a non-branched main beam. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional cab comment? Okay, seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, any public comment on Zoom? Okay, with that, I'll bring it back to the commission. And I guess, Cody, you can, we had the discussion last time about making the, making the wholesale change to change it to a management hunt would be a massive undertaking, if I'm not correct. 
Yeah, Chairman Caviglia, uh, Cody McKee for the record. I think uh, Deputy Attorney General uh, Burkett ran the numbers and it was like referenced over a dozen times within NAC. So it would require a, a more concentrated effort to, to make that revision. Yeah, and I, and I just, again, again, just my opinion, I think if we took it to two points, that does mirror, uh, you know, regulations in other states for a spike hunt. You know, I know a lot of spikes do have a fork. Um, and I think you'd kind of, you, if we went to two, you'd kind of keep it closer to an actual kind of what people think of a spike in my opinion, but Commissioner Wise. I guess I have a little bit of a clarifying question. Um, because the term spike elk does generally refer to a single spike, um, I am curious about the evolution of that to two or three. I can see how um, two points above the ear was meant to exclude anything, perhaps intention, the attention at least, was that anything small that you might not see that might be hidden that you might otherwise um, count as a spike. And so I guess um, that brings me back to um, is, do we have that protection by saying two spikes? Um, it's a spike out content, it's supposed to be one, but there, there might be a second protrusion, or in this case, we're allowing a third protrusion. Um, so I just wanted to, I guess, get a little clarification from you on um, whether the original intent was for it to be a single spike and then allow for that small variance, and now we're extending that out to two and three, or um, what that looks like. Yeah, Commissioner Wise, Cody McKee, for the record, you're, you're on the point, so the 2014 definition was just a single uh, main beam with that unbranched, I think as uh, Washoe Cab member Robinson pointed out. Um, and again, it was public comment from people in the field, uh, one person in particular that had experiences where they saw spike bulls that didn't exactly meet that criteria. So it was the departments and the commissions um, cooperate or uh, through public comment and cooperation came up with this revised definition uh, in 2021, we implemented uh, substantially more spike hunts across the state. Um, and I think tag quotas doubled approximately. And so we had a lot more people with eyes on this regulation and eyes in the field. And that's where that confusion really started to, to become more pronounced. Um, with respect to just these inadvertent points, uh, you know, I think three points gets us there, it probably is going to capture the majority of uh, protrusions that people don't see when they harvest a bull. Um, but again, just based on our harvest data, what we saw, the majority of bulls were two points or less. And so these projections are probably anomalies. And obviously, I can't speak for law enforcement. Um, but I, I suspect that there may be some consideration given if a hunter inadvertently harvests, harvests a bull with these, these tiny projections that might meet the definition of an antler point, but obviously at distance, maybe they weren't, uh, maybe they weren't something that were uh, readily visible. Commissioner Keel. Yeah, can you pull up that visual where you've got the, you know, the two points and three points, I think it had the percentage, maybe one back. Maybe it was even the first picture. Yeah, so if we had three points on this bull, it would be legal. If we went to two points, that bull would not be legal, correct? That's correct. That's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, you you cherry picked a picture there, though, too. That bull's got like, <laughs> that is an absolute that's anomaly. Yeah, well, and yeah. that, that's the thing, as I, as I pointed out, I mean, we this, this occurs in young male elk. But it's certainly not widespread. Um, it's, it's infrequent, but the definition was designed to address this particular situation. Um, and so here we are, you know, we're, with this reference to the year, it works for uh, antelope hunting here because you're just referencing the length of the horn to the year. And I think that is a little bit more of a black and white definition versus the presence of an of an of a branch on a bull elk and where that falls within the the ear length. 
Commissioner Rogers. Um, Cody, I apologize for doing this to you. Could you go a couple of slides forward? Sure. On, so uh, on the 2.97 and then the next slide, uh, 98. Yeah. So anyway, we're, I, I think from a percentage standpoint, it probably is, is splitting, in my opinion, splitting hairs a little bit. But I think, again, we're dancing on that perception of kind of what we've talked about, right, this management or what a true spike is. So, um, again, for me personally, just where my head's at based on some of those percentages being so close, uh, I'm much more comfortable and would be supportive of the two points and striking the above the ear than I am uh, three point. I think, you know, again, three point is uh, uh, it, it's just getting a little ahead of the, in my opinion, what the spirit of a spike is. So I would uh, be supportive of two and uh, striking above the ear and not supportive of three. Mr. Walter. Um, I appreciate the Cavs coming and uh, more sports, sportsmen providing some commentary on the issue with the term spike. Um, you know, I think that's very useful. It's obviously going to take a lot of work to clean that up. I, th I think what we're really trying to address here is, one, those inadvertent violations by what was a completely confusing um, definition previously or is now um, and perhaps you know we step back um, consider what work we need to do to perhaps change the term of this hunt at some point but there's a true problem in the field I think needs to be addressed now um, and I have a hard time sitting here arguing over two or three points and please correct me Cody if I'm wrong when what we're truly trying to do with this hunt is achieve a management objective of getting young bulls out of the herd um, so when we're sitting here arguing over two or three points I mean are we making that more difficult for sportsmen to ultimately achieve the objective uh, the man management objective of the department um, and perhaps we you know put our boots on and say we're gonna have to do some hard work later down the road to change all these definitions address the problem now in the inadvertent violations and um, achieve the objectives of the division yeah Chairman Cavilia, Cody McKee, for the record, I appreciate the comments by Commissioner Walter on this topic. I mean, the ultimate goal of the spike hunts, and spike is kind of this fluid definition that's been adopted by various Western states to remove yearling bulls, so bulls that are one year old from the population, um, because you can take those bulls out and have a, have a direct effect on the overall bull ratio without affecting the back end, so the mature bulls that hunters are probably more interested in. Um, when we go through these photographs, all of the photographs that I've shown you here in this presentation, these are one-year-old bulls. Now, potentially genetics, nutrition have all played a part in why they're exhibiting the antler characteristics that they are. As Commissioner Walter pointed out, these are the ones that we want to take removed from the population. So again, you know, going back to two points or three points, I mean, that... It, I really don't have a, a sword to fall on there. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the commission supports removing the year. I think um, both myself, our biologists, and our law enforcement will be happy that that's removed. Um, you know, again, the majority of harvest is coming from two-point bulls or less, and if that is something that's going to be more acceptable in the eyes of the public and the people that are concerned that our spike definitions aren't necessarily spikes, that kind of gets us closer to that. Um, but again, from a management perspective, all of these bulls are getting us the department where we want to go. Yeah, and I mean, I, I agree too. We're we're really splitting hairs. It's just the, and I this is not the hill I'm going to die on at all. But um, I just think the two point it kind of gets you closer to the what everyone thinks is the de definition of a spike. But um, again, I'm not going to 
not going to die on that hill either. So I kind of see what everybody else thinks or if somebody wants to make a motion or Vice Chair Rogers. All right. If yeah, if there isn't any other discussion, I'll try and take a take a stab at this. So I'd like to make a motion uh, for approval of Commission General Rela Regulation 508, Antler Points and Spike Elk Definition, uh, specifically to uh, 502.014 of that definition. Um, to read that a spike elk means any antlered elk having not more than two points on either uh, antler and again striking out that above the top of the ear and then in 502.1045 uh, to read spike elk only means in a designation of elk that may be taken during an open season only antlered elk not more than two points on either antler again striking out above the top of the year. Okay, we have a motion. Second. Or? Uh, Chairman Cavilia, there's also yes. the antler point uh, clarification that was supposed to be included in Chapter 502 um, for the purposes of NRS 501.3855 and NAC 502.06. The department interprets the exclusion of the first antler point on the main beam as described in the definition of antler point in uh, NRS 501.3855 to be limited to mule deer. Yeah, and I guess, I guess the question was, is, um, do you have, do you, is your motion approved going with that as written or? Yes. So we have a motion by Commissioner Rogers. Is there a second or? I'll second. Okay, and a second. Okay, so, and I guess who seconded that? Commissioner Walter, okay, I'm sorry. I was looking the other way. <laughs> I no just worries. heard a voice down there. I have a motion by Vice Chair Rogers, second by Commissioner Walter on Commission General Regulation 508, antler points and spike elk defined uh, with the noted changes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye, opposed? Okay, motion carries carries unanimously with Commissioner Perini and Barnes absent. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, and we'll be sure to get diagrams put into this year's hunt guide so so hunters know exactly what is and isn't a legal bull from the yep. spike hunt. That would be appreciated. Thanks. Okay, agenda item 15B, Commission General, General Regulation 510, first come, first serve exchange to obtain a tag. Management analysis, Megan Manfredi for possible action. The commission will hold an adoption hearing to consider a temporary regulation amending Nevada Administrative Code 502 that would include any money, goods, or services exchanged for procurement of a tag through the first come, first serve program as grounds for suspension from the program. Thank you again, Chairman. Commission, uh, Management Analyst Megan Manfredi for the record. Uh, I'll give a quick recap of the changes being proposed as this regulation was discussed yesterday. The changes include the exchange of any types of goods and services to the list of activities that are caused for suspension from the first come first serve program and are intended to deter individuals from creating an unfair advantage and to discourage individuals from seeking out the use of a potential unfair advantage when attempting to obtain a tag in the program. The change also includes the language all involved parties which will allow the department to suspend the individual offering the service as well as individuals utilizing the service of the unfair advantage. And again, this regulation is presented to the commission during a temporary regulation period and will be brought back sometime around next summer to uh, establish it as a permanent regulation. So with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Megan? Okay, we'll take it out for pa cab comment. Any cab comment for Megan? Or yeah, for Megan. Seeing none, any public comment? Any public comment on Zoom? Okay, I'll bring it back to agenda item, uh, or I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, Chairman, I will move to approve 
uh, Commission General Regulation 510, first come, first serve exchange to obtain a tag, as presented. Second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner East, second by Commissioner McNinch to comp approve Commission General Reg Regulation 510, first come, first serve exchange to obtain a tag. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry mo motion carries unanimously with uh, Commissioner Barnes and Perini absent. And then I think I skipped over commission item 14C, did I? Or did we do that one? Oh, no, we did that. Okay, I'm sorry. Losing my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Agenda item number 16. Future commission meetings and commission committee assignments. Secretary Wosley and Chairman Cavilia for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for January 27th and 28th, 2023. The commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change the date, time, and meeting location at this time. The chairman may designate and adjust committee assignments and add or dissolve committees as necessary at this time. Any anticipated committee meetings that may occur prior to the next commission meeting may be discussed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a couple suggested uh, changes for the commission to consider um, in terms of meeting locations and dates. The locations um, aren't proposed to change, but we do have some challenges with some of the, the dates in the next year. So if, uh, if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll propose or um, offer those before we talk about some of the specifics for the next commission meeting. And as noted at the outset of today's meeting, as well as yesterday's, um, the next commission meeting is scheduled for January 27th and 28th of 2023. Um, some of the challenges that as we look at the next year that we're uh, presented with first occurs at the March meeting. And so that March meeting, for 2023 is presently scheduled for March 17th and 18th in Las Vegas. And at that meeting, uh, standard uh, items, agenda items include uh, setting and revising waterfowl seasons and limits and, and legislative items. Um, we'd, we would uh, certainly like to see the commission consider perhaps moving that uh, to a week earlier, to March 10th and 11th. Uh, we have some, some challenges that particular uh, weekend of the 17th, Friday the 17th, Saturday the 18th, as it uh, overlaps with March Madness, which creates uh, challenges in not only attendance, but also uh, room availability uh, in, in Las Vegas, which is the slated location for that meeting to occur. Uh, we also uh, have often have conflicts that time of year with the uh, North American Conference of Natural Resource Management and attendance of, of staff, which uh, limits perhaps moving that, that later. So we would like to see the commission consider uh, moving that a week earlier to March 10th and 11th in that same location. The other uh, meeting with some potential conflicts occurs in September. Uh, we have, and that meeting is also scheduled for Las Vegas. That meeting is presently scheduled for September 22nd and 23rd in Las Vegas. We typically set and revise the biennial fishing regulations during that meeting. Uh, those are set in odd numbered years and amended in even numbered years. As you'll recall, we, we just did that uh, couple months ago in, in Las Vegas. We have uh, similar challenges with venues and rooms. Um, some of the conflicting events in September include the uh, Life is Beautiful event in Las Vegas. Uh, we also have the challenge of the annual Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency meeting, um, which limits some of our calendar options for September and would like the commission to consider a proposal to combine those slated agenda items. As you'll recall from our last September meeting, we had a fairly light agenda and we'd like the commission to consider combining those items, typically 
uh, business items typically conducted at that September meeting, combining that with the August meeting, and that August meeting is scheduled for August 11 and 12 of 23, uh, presently scheduled for Fallon. Uh, that's the meeting where we typically, uh, you all typically elect a chair and vice chair. Uh, we have the county advisory board workshop. Uh, we have a report from the WAFWA annual conference, and we get a report on public works contracts as well as the hunt application draw report. So given the challenges uh, with the calendar, the challenges with overlapping events in, in Vegas, the light uh, commission agenda that we experienced this past September, uh, we'd like the commission to consider uh, possibly combining those August and September uh, agenda items and conducting uh, that meeting uh, together with the uh, already scheduled uh, August meeting. And I, I think there's a possibility what we we uh, would also um, encourage consideration of is is um, perhaps even moving that August agenda a little bit later, kind of splitting the difference between that August meeting and September uh, to give us a little bit more time to develop um, support material and, um, and, and agenda items. As far as the next meeting is scheduled for January 27th and 28th, um, that January meeting, uh, typically uh, items include the draft predation management plan, big game seasons and regulations, which are set in odd numbered years, which uh, will be the case in January, uh, black bear seasons that are set annually, mountain lion limits and quotas also set annually, heritage tag seasons and quotas, set annually a year in advance. Dream tag, partnership and wildlife, Silver State tag seasons and quotas set annually. Big game application deadline and big game tag eligibility, which are set annually. And then we would have reports from the WAFWA midwinter <coughs> meeting, the wildlife heritage account report, and legislative committee reports um, in, in odd numbered years, which again um, would would be the case. And then as was discussed this morning at the legislative committee uh, meeting, uh, we would we would have a legislative committee um, meeting and a, and a report out from that that committee at, at that January meeting. We would also bring forward those uh, regulations Commission general regular or the the regulations and policies that were moved to the next meeting as discussed yesterday So I know that's a lot um, But that's what I have on on uh, my agenda Okay, and then I guess uh, director Wosley in regards to that move in that August meeting do you want to Do you want to bring a proposed date to us at a later? Later meeting I know you discussed moving it back we, we can do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that would probably uh, be best to allow us for an opportunity to um, secure a venue um, and make sure lodging can be accommodated as well. Um, we, we can do that and bring that back to you in, in January. And then I guess, do we need, would we need to make a motion right now to combine that September and August meeting, or could we do that at that time? I just you could do that at that time as well. Okay. I just wanted to put it on your uh, radar sooner than later. Uh, the, the March meeting is probably the, the more timely concern. Uh, if we can put a bow on that one, that would be great. And then we can address the, the September, August options at, in, in January. Okay. Any questions or comments, Jeff? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, if we could, I haven't seen the schedule for next year, at least that I've, uh, I can recall. Um, so if we could just get uh, a copy or Tony, you could even read those dates off if you have them handy there. I do. Um, I'll let you do that first and then I'll make my, oh, was this part of your packet? No, oh. it was just in my binder. Oh, I, who knows what I did with mine. <laughs> Clearly, she has one. So, <laughs> okay, I'll just copy hers. Up. So, 
Um, you guys know where I'm at with NCAA basketball. So, um, yeah, I appreciate moving that up to uh, the 10th and the 11th of March. And um, uh, I don't know if there's more discussion, but I can uh, certainly prepare to make a motion when you're ready. So I think you have to go out to public yeah. comments still. So. Any additional questions or comments? I just want to clarify. Um, oh, wait, I'm looking at the wrong dates. Never mind. We're good. Okay. All right, I'm going to take it out for cab comment. Any cab comment? Seeing none, any public comment? Any public comment on Zoom? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I'll make a motion um, uh, that we're, well, I guess we're still waiting for a venue for the January meeting, Tony. Is that what you were stating? Are we good? It's just here. It's here. Okay. Yep. Well, I'll make a motion to, that we uh, clarify that um, due to the agenda item here that the January 27th and 28th meeting uh, for 2023 will be held uh, here in Reno, um, that, that we change the March meeting from its current proposed date of March 17th and 18th, 2023 to uh, March 10th and 11th, 2023. Um, and then we'll just make a note in our in the motion that uh, uh, there'll be some uh, that we'll combine the September meeting with the August meeting on a date to be determined. That's my motion. Who's second? How long is our Casey? Okay, so I got a motion by Commissioner McNinch, seconded by Commissioner Keel. And I'm not going to try to repeat it. But. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carry. Motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Perini and Barnes absent. Okay, public comment period. A public comment in Reno. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Craig Burnside, Douglas Cab. As I was sitting making notes on the actions that you've taken today, <laughs> I'm thinking back to the first photo that, of the anomaly that Cody put up. And with the passage of the language that the first point on an elk doesn't count as an antler point, but it's two points per side, does that anomaly still meet the criteria of the new regulation since that First point isn't counted. I don't know if we've taken away the confusion or not. Any additional public comment? Good morning, uh, Rick Lund, Washoe County. And I just wanted to speak about the um, Raptor capture permits in the state of Nevada regarding a proposal made to Washoe County. Um, for years now, there's been a um, no trapping of goshawks in northern Elko County. And there's really no biological reason for prohibiting us from trapping uh, passage goshawks because they're migratory. They're wintering from Oregon, from Idaho, and everything, and coming through those ranges. I understand that Elko County doesn't want the IS goshawks taken from the canyons, but I just hope that there'd be serious consideration for the uh, making it legal to trap passage goshawks in uh, anywhere in the state where they're available, especially since they are, in most cases, migrating. You know, they're not uh, birds that were born or hatched in Elko County. And uh, so when you go to consider this, uh, if you'll just keep that in mind, it's a in my opinion, it's been a um, error that's been interpreted wrong. It was originally when it was uh, put into law, it was intended for the IS goshawks, and it just sort of got interpreted as all goshawks north of Interstate 80. So I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Seeing none, any public comment on Zoom? Okay, with that, uh, we won't be adjourned. We're gonna go take the tour now of Lenar Pond. Okay. 
the field trip, uh, the department does have quite a few vehicles here. So uh, to make sure we don't get a bunch of people lost and everything, we will go out in agency vehicles and then we'll return here. Uh, so plan on agency vehicles. Thank you. What's that? Yeah, we'll take a quick, we'll take a 10 minute or 15 minute break before we leave from the parking lot.